Welcome to a Minnesota DNR presentation. This is part one on the roles of local officials in preparation, response, and recovery for disasters in general, but focusing on floods. We'll be talking about preparation in this part. Part two covers response and recovery. Many different community staff have roles before and after the flood, and we'll touch on many of those roles. During floods, it's chaotic. Some local officials will be making rescues and making sure everyone is safe. Others will be getting reports on the impacted areas and coordinating the neighboring communities and other agencies. Traffic will likely be snarled. And if the flood is early in the season, you might have the extra challenge of ice and frigid flood fighting conditions. The flood response cycle includes preparation, response, recovery, mitigation, then restarting the cycle. The goal is to have less damage and disruption to your community during the next flood or other disaster. We'll talk about the preparation part of the cycle in this presentation and about response and recovery and a bit about mitigation in our second presentation. In this presentation, we'll talk about some things you and your community can do to prepare and hopefully keep things less chaotic when the next flood or other disaster hits your community, including reviewing your floodplain ordinance and brushing up on permitting responsibilities, reviewing past floods and updated flood data, preparing or updating your response plan, knowing what forecasting resources are available, inventorying your structures at risk, setting up help for bigger events, and resources for the next steps. Staff responsible for administering your community's floodplain management ordinance should brush up on what the ordinance requires. The best way to prevent flood damage is to follow your ordinance for any new constructions, additions, or anything else. But if you have homes and businesses in the regulated floodplain that were built before your first FEMA map and ordinance, or homes and businesses where the floodplain mapping was updated to show higher risk after they were built, be sure to review your nonconformities section so you know the permitting requirements for reconstruction. Review your current FEMA floodplain maps and find out what supporting data you have. This is an example of a newer Digital Flood Insurance Rate Map, or DFIRM. If you have a DFIRM, GIS, or computer mapping layers will be available. Many FEMA flood maps in Minnesota are still old paper maps that became official in the 1970s or 1980s based on even older data. But sometimes there are GIS layers or computer mapping layers that are helpful but not okay. And many of the paper map counties, like Dodge County shown in this example, are getting updated flood risk modeling and data. So digital work maps or preliminary new maps may be available. Find more about the map update status and available data on the DNR's Flood Maps page or County Data and Map Viewers page. We'll have links to these and other resources at the end of this video. Review your community's PLAST flood records, including photos or aerials taken during flooding. Take note of past impacts and flood levels to help prepare for the next flood and share those impacts with your local National Weather Service office to help them calibrate flood stages. And don't forget to check the historical flooding section in your community or countywide flood insurance study that is used with your flood maps. And your county or city should have an all hazard mitigation plan that is updated on a 10 year cycle. Those usually have good historical information and priorities for projects to reduce damage from future floods or other disasters. And get to know your county emergency manager if you don't already know them. They will be a key contact in all stages of the flood response cycle. Next, we'll talk about more specific examples of response planning and resources including identifying where to prepare for flood fighting, helpful Corps of Engineers resources, and identifying critical facilities. The Minnesota Department of Labor and Industry has the Disaster Preparedness Manual that was most recently updated in 2019. 
It's targeted at building officials and has lots of useful information. Be sure to check it out. Based on past floods or your flood maps and data, identify where your community is most likely to need emergency dikes, sandbagging, or road barriers. Verify you don't have buildings in the way and have necessary access agreements or easements. Make sure you have material sources that won't be underwater when flooding is in progress. In this case, they use material from a soccer field. The St. Paul District of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers has lots of great resources on their emergency management pages. You can get the latest version of the Emergency Action Plan Guidebook here, which offers instructions for a community to create its own flood emergency action plan. It has lots of templates and examples, and you can use the portions that make sense for your community. The Corps also holds one-day community-level workshops on using the guidebook, bringing together the different staff in the communities who would be working together and talking through the planning and preparation steps face-to-face. -face. There's also a link to the Community Resources Toolbox. On the Community Resources Toolbox page, you can find a link to the Flood Fight Handbook, which has lots of practical guidance to prepare for flooding. There are also more specific guides and videos on emergency levees and sandbagging, including this video on how to do proper sandbagging. An important step in preparation is getting an org chart together. Get your contacts and responsibilities in one place and understand lines of communication. It's a lot better if you can do this before the next disaster. The Corps of Engineers Emergency Action Plan Guidebook was just mentioned and has some excellent sections on flood response organization and contacts. In particular, Take a look at Chapter 3 on Mutual Aid and Chapter 4 on Personnel. This is a good reminder of how helpful the format of that guidebook is for both addressing the highest priority planning steps to get started and giving guidance on more ideas for preparation. Review where your critical facilities are located and whether they are at higher risk for flooding. Those include public utilities, like this well house, the entire community will be affected if your water or wastewater plants or power stations or other utilities have to shut down during a flood. Even if just a few homes and businesses are directly damaged by a flood, businesses and schools and the whole community will be impacted if key services shut down. Other critical facilities include places like the hospital shown here and schools, nursing homes, your fire station, and other key public facilities. If you can do projects to make those places less flood prone before the flood, that's the best option. If you have low parts of your city that you know will need evacuations or campgrounds that are in a floodplain, they should have an evacuation plan, including knowing what river gauge forecasts or knowing the amount of rain forecasted that will trigger action and who is responsible for each step. Next, we'll talk about forecasting resources. But first, are staff from your community getting the forecast updates from your National Weather Service office? Your county emergency manager can also help you ensure you are getting the National Weather Service or other applicable local updates. Get familiar with any gauges in your area or upstream of your community. This page on the National Weather Service site shows the available gauges in the state. Note this legend. The shape of the gauge points shows the level of service available. Some show just the real-time readings, but others show forecasts during times of flooding. And some show longer range probabilities of flooding for the upcoming season, and are especially helpful for looking at how bad spring flooding might be based on existing snow and water content. Note that the minor, moderate, and major flooding triggers are based on the levels of damage a community would experience as a river gets to those gauge levels or river stages. They are not based on the flood levels on FEMA maps and that are used in your floodplain management ordinance. This major flooding trigger could be the 500-year flood or it could be a 10-year flood or some other level of flooding. 
In fact, since many communities have done projects for buyouts to reduce the risk of flood damage, when this site shows major flooding risk at a certain river level, it may not, in fact, mean that much damage in your community anymore. The National Weather Service has adjusted the major, moderate, and minor triggers for many Minnesota gauges, but those triggers may still need updating for your community's gauge. This River Forecasts tab shows just the gauges that show forecasting. Pick your gauge of interest. You'll see what's predicted for the next few days. Get familiar with the type of flooding you have. A smaller, flashier stream like in this example shows the river coming up about 12 feet in a matter of hours. But on the bigger rivers, like this example on the Mississippi or other big rivers, you'll usually have a couple of weeks of warning before hitting the peak flood elevations. Other great places to look for river gauges in Minnesota are the USGS site and the Cooperative Stream Gauging Network site. At the Cooperative Gauging Network site, you can see and download a lot of helpful data for these gauges. Just to give you an idea of the options, here's an example of what you'll see for a gauge. The default view is the real-time reading for the past week, but you can adjust the period of record for the graph. Here's an example showing a longer period of record, useful for reviewing how high past flooding got and you can narrow the period of record to see how fast the water came up. Check out the gauges in your area. It is a pretty user-friendly site. Another step in preparation for disasters is to inventory structures and parts of your community most at risk and identify priority risk reduction projects. In parts of the state with more recent flood mapping and modeling, you may have depth grids available or be able to create them using available data. These allow review of what homes and businesses are most at risk or what roads need closing at different flood depths. If your community has a lot of buildings that were constructed before you had FEMA floodplain maps and your floodplain ordinance, or areas with buildings where floodplain data has been updated and shows greater risk, strongly consider doing a community level substantial damage plan for disaster response. We'll talk more about substantial damage in our second video on response and recovery roles for local officials. On this map, you can see a few light blue homes in the 100-year flood zone where your local floodplain regulations are enforced. But look at all the darker blue homes that are in the 500-year floodplain, so outside the current regulated area. Note that today's 500-year floodplain is becoming the new 100-year floodplain or even the 50-year floodplain. As our updated modeling includes more years of data and our weather patterns change over time. Identify those buildings, utilities, and roads at risk when water levels get higher and consider higher local ordinance regulations that better protect new development for future higher flood elevations. In some places, with a more extensive flooding history, we have good examples of maps that show what gets flooded at different river levels. On the National Weather Service site, where we saw the river gauges earlier, there is an inundation map for St. Paul, where you can see what's covered by possible floods in one foot increments. This first map is showing the river at a gauge height of 22 feet, a bit above the 50 year flood. The second map is showing the river at a gauge height of 27 feet, about a foot above the record flood and the 500-year flood. On this City of Moorhead site, you can see where flooding occurs in half-foot increments. This example shows the river gauge height of 41 feet, which is about halfway between the 100-year and 500-year flood and just above the flood of record in 2009. Our last main topic is to note some options for assistance with bigger floods, both at the state and federal levels. Be aware of resources for bigger events. This site on the Department of Labor and Industry site has information on how to get help from other building officials around the state and to volunteer to help other parts of the state. It also has the link to the Disaster Preparedness Manual shown earlier. In really big floods, 
the state may need to ask for help from outside the state. Emergency Management Assistance Compact, or EMAC, assistance can be requested by the state's Emergency Management Agency on behalf of the governor, if there is a governor-declared emergency. Once you've taken steps to be prepared, be sure to schedule at least an annual review of your response plans to be sure everything is up to date. And consider an annual outreach letter, or emails, that target your most at-risk residents. Go to the Minnesota DNR's floodplain management page using the quick link mndnr.gov forward slash floodplain for access to many resources. The DNR flood preparation, response, and recovery page has links to most of the resources we've talked about, and more about flood mapping and data can be found at this Maps and Technical Resources links and many counties have links to new data work maps or preliminary new maps at the quick link mndnr.gov forward slash county FP data. Are you ready for the next steps? Under this video, you'll see a DNR logo and the words show more. Click on the show more to expand the information you see where you'll find a link to part two of this video on the local officials role in response and recovery and a link to all the useful resources mentioned in this video. Thanks for watching our presentation. For more details on the topics covered here, please contact DNR staff at the email on this slide.